Hey everyone, it's Tony Tom Logan back with another video for you and today we have one heck of a video for you as well because we have the 3700X and the 3900X Ryzen 3000 or Zen 2. There's too many 2s and 3s in this, it gets confusing but we've done an awful lot of testing because obviously or maybe not obviously to some these processors are backwards compatible so we have actually tested them on the all new X570 kit. So We've done it on the Crosshair 8, it's actually this side formula, but the hint was this side as well because we've also done all of the testing on X470 as well. We mixed in some of the new GPUs, so we've got the 5700 XT and we've got the 5700, so the first PCI Express 4 graphics cards. I've tested those on both platforms as well. We've also got a PCI Express 4 SSD, which we have tested on both platforms as well. Stock coolers chucked in, overclocking, little dibble dabble into undervolting as well. So really what we're going to be able to tell you by the end of this video is do you need to be upgrading to X570? For That could be great news for those of you out there with X470 and you're looking should I just buy a processor? Can I get a PCI Express 4 hard drive for example? Lots and lots of answers. So for the regulars, go and get your crisps, go and get your chips, make yourself a cup of tea, coffee, grab some coke, get comfortable because there's a heck of a lot of information just about to get dumped out of my brain to you. Okay then peeps, so I am going to assume that you're not just going to watch my video. I know some of the regulars are going to say they come here first and I'm incredibly flattered for those of you that do do that. But I am going to assume that you're going to go to a lot of other people to watch the video. So I'm going to kind of base the bulk of my video on my testing rather than telling you about the processors over and over again and flashing up things like the X570 platform layout because a lot of people are gonna, like I said, you are gonna get that from a lot of other sources but I'll splash it up there quick so that you can kind of have a look how the uh, PCI Express 4 lanes because there's 24 in the CPUs and then you get some in the chipset as well and I'm gonna leave that for you to kind of pick apart the thing that I do want to talk about is the actual product stack though with the CPUs themselves and the fact that there are a, a few prices out there that you should keep your eyes open for. So the processors, yes, you've got the 3900X at the top which has 12 cores and 24 threads. There's a fairly healthy amount of boost and uh, base clock going on with the range but I've actually got the 37 and the 39 today. When I pop the prices in, you can see that the 37 is 319 and the 3900X is 479. When we kind of mix in the competing Intel prices as well, you can see that the 9700K is 359 and then the 9900K has been getting some price decreases just before the video. So to be fair, I've used the prices that I found on OC UK in the UK today, which was 449. They knocked 10% off of it because last week it was £499 and today it's £449. So, you know, I'm kind of, I'm not sure whether I'm being fair to AMD or whether I'm being fair to Nvidia, but the, uh, sorry, fair to um, AMD. But there, these are the prices that can be found at the time that the video was filmed. So, you know, rather than kind of putting it at the base prices when they were, when they first come out. Now... One thing I will say is there have been, uh, there is a lot of chatter about PCI Express 4 motherboard prices, so I'll cover that quite early on. What's happened with the PCI Express 4 prices is it's actually uh, a bit more difficult for the motherboard manufacturers to be able to produce them. You need uh, signal amplifiers in there, you need PCI Express 4 switches, and there's just a lot more components that go on the board but they're also having to make big or more effort with the actual PCB of the boards themselves. You're gonna see boards with more layers. You're gonna see boards where they, they're using more copper for the traces. You're just gonna see a much higher quality product with the boards and that's one of the reasons why the prices have bumped up. 
So by AMD uh, kind of saying, right, you need to have all the PCI Express 4 on the board, the board manufacturers have done that, but because they have implemented it, it does mean that board prices have gone up a fair bit. Also, where we do know that the 3900X is 12 cores, um, and then there's, you know, we know in September already there's going to be the 3950X, which is uh, 16 cores. Manufacturers have already kind of made a shift to supercharging, let's say, the VRMs to make sure that there's no um, possible issues with temperature and all of that sort of thing. So a lot of the menus, as the boards go up, you'll see that the components that they're using on the VRMs and the amount of VRMs that they are using have gone through the roof but so have the prices as well. Now the 3900X as I've seen is 479. We're told, hinted in dollars at least that the 3950X when it comes is going to be 749. But this is where the water's muddy a little and I just wanna give you a, maybe a little bit of perspective on how things are going to pan out with these. So, Let's just say you have, uh, on the Intel side, you have Z390, and then you have X299 boards, and the processors step up between those products. Now, with AMD, it's all going on AM4, so you could pretty much buy yourself a lower, well, a mid-range um, uh, X570 board, let's say for argument's sake, the Strix X570 board, and you could pop a 3600X in it but then you might get a massive bonus from work and you could go, oh, I'm going to go and buy myself a, th a 3950X now instead. And you could take that processor and put it in the exact same board. If you were gonna do that with Intel, however, then you would be a little bit stuck because you'd find yourself with your 9600K and then you'd have to go out and if you wanted to go and buy, let's say a 7980, uh, or a 7900X, you'd then have to go and buy a completely different board and your processor as well. So with the range of prices on these boards, I would say that the range of prices go with the range of processors. Now, the motherboards in the AMD stack will seem more expensive than the ones in the competing Intel stack. And that's, uh, that's just the way it's going to be. But once you mix the prices of the AMD processors in, that's when Overall, the AMD products end up being cheaper because if you had a 16 core, well, no, let's just go with the 3900X, for example. If you had that 12 core processor and a motherboard, even an expensive motherboard, you may be looking at 1250 quid. Whereas if you then went and bought, let's say, the 7900X and a high end X299 motherboard, you're probably still going to end up with more cores and this a similar kind of board, if not a better board, with the, um, the AMD side. So I know there are a lot of people kind of going on about, oh my God, the boards are so expensive, but that's kind of why. And you need to kind of take a step back and not necessarily just focus on the fact that the boards are so much more expensive. But if the boards are so much more expensive, then you probably weren't going to be one of the people that were going to buy them in the first place. You may aspire to, and that's brilliant, but would you have been buying the competing Intel part? You know, that's how you need to kind of pan it out. So if you went and priced up your, your Intel rig, and then you went and bought the exact same AMD rig with a competing part, then you're probably going to find, or you will find, that you've saved money. So that's just something to kind of uh, keep in mind. Now, I'm going to go thick and fast into uh, overclocking. Like I said, we did do some temperature testing with the uh, stock cooler, but we need to talk about overclocking and stuff first. Um, and then there's lots of talk about power, and th 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 there is an awful, awful lot to get through. And then right at the end, I have probably got some information which may shock a lot of you. Uh, and I have spoken in depth to AMD directly about this and uh, the board manufacturers as well because the way things pan out in the end is a bit weird and you're probably not going to be prepared for what I'm going to suggest the bulk of you do. Anyway, 
So I'm going to save the best bit because honestly, we'll keep the best bit for the end because in, in reality, it is a bit of a shock. So overclocking on the processors, we got 4.4 out of both of them around the 1.5 volt mark for the both of them as well. Now you do need to keep in mind that the 3700X is actually a low power part, 65 watt, whereas the um, 3900X is a 105 watt part, but they both needed about the same sort of voltage. Now, in reality, at launch, essentially they are basically just the same sort of processor underneath the hood and it's just different boost clocks and base clocks that's underneath them. And with the old AMD processors, this, unless you got yourself a really, really good bit of silicon lottery, then uh, they were all roughly the same anyway. They were all needing before around the 1.4-ish volt mark. Now with these, for an all core clock, you didn't particularly, you did need to push those volts up. That was the thing. Now one of the things I will say is that would have been for 4.4 on both. But out of the box, they are doing an all core, just a boost on their own and between kind of like 4.2 and 4.3 anyway, where it depends. With um, the uh, 3700X, you were looking around the 4.2 mark and with this one, you were looking around the 4.3 mark. So you don't really go in that manual route, you don't really get uh, you know, you get a few little extra frames per second and stuff, and you'll see in the graphs it can make a bit of difference. But, you know, if you're just looking at sole numbers, there doesn't appear to be a great deal there. Something else within the uh, stack, which is a feature as well, is the precision boost overdrive. And you can actually, from the start, uh, set an offset to the PBO. So you can actually bump the, all of the base clocks up by 200 megahertz, and then it boosts from there or onwards as well. So that's actually a really, really clever feature that you can do within the BIOS on the boards or within um, Ryzen Master, and just go and add, it's 50, 100, 150, or 200 megahertz uh, as a kind of base offset. And that's a great feature for a lot of people. And it is going to be something that I'm going to be doing um, some uh, more in-depth testing because we've mixed so many things in and essentially done two processors on two separate boards, plus extra GPUs and like uh, memory, um, sorry, memory testing because we've done an awful lot of memory testing and then solid state drive testing as well. It's taken us like five days to just get through this stage of things and I've still got motherboards for you to review as well. So... That side of the precision boost is great, and I would suggest that an entry-level user that's new to this kind of thing, doesn't particularly like to um, mess around with things too much, that will be a really, really great way for you to uh, get some f basically free and easy performance. So that's gonna be really good for you to take a look at. Um, AMD actually sent us a 3600 megahertz uh, G skill, it's like the gold Trident Z Royal Super Duper kit. Anyway, they sent us one of those, and uh, they, and, and let's face it, not being funny, the Ryzen uh, 2000 series memory was always an issue, and you'd kind of get to 3200 megahertz as being a bit of a sweet spot, and then it kind of tailed off. With these, we were doing 36, really easy, XMP across the board. And then we, it, it, we didn't really have any issues with it either. But we were promised that we were going to be able to get really quick speeds from them as well. Now, I'm lucky enough to have a Corsair Vengeance RGB kit that's 4600 megahertz. And I managed to get both the processors nigh on running it. The 3900X got a bit shaky at 36, but we ended up with like five, um, sorry, 4533 able to DOCP which is like XMP, but we were able to get that running without really any manual intervention. The 3700X could easily go all the way to 3600 megahertz. Sorry, 4600 megahertz. This is getting crazy now, isn't it? We're talking like memory speeds as fast as clock speeds. Anyway, this you 4.4 on both was absolutely like really easy. But one thing I will say is once you got to about 4000 megahertz, the bonuses that you were getting from driving that speed up negated. So they, they tailored out. You did get a tiny bit of extra performance, but it wasn't massive steps like it should have been. 
we might have been able to have tuned this in with some better um, sub timings on the memory but the fact it run was a good pos you know a good positive point there if i was to say for anyone at home early on about memory speeds i would say 36 is the sweet point and that's exactly why amd sent it to us you will be able to drive up to about 4,000 megahertz and get some decent performance pieces. And I don't mean overclocking, I mean buying up to a 4,000 megahertz kit. But once you get past that point, so buying a 42, a 44 or a 46 kit, you are literally just going to be chasing numbers and it's going to be more about EP in your spec list rather than raw performance. Also, from my experience with the two processors, the 3900X, like I said, it got difficult at 46. I don't think it's something you'd end up being able to use long term without a massive amount of knowledge to be able to keep um, like playing with it and setting stuff up. 44 was really at the point for a normal user at home, you'll be able to get running easily without having to mess around too much. So like I said, 4,000 is probably the point I would advise the bulk of people stop, but 36, if you're just going to build a kit, click and then enable XMP stroke DOCP in the BIOS is probably the sweet spot. But if you've got a really good 3200 megahertz kit at home, it's not necessarily going to make any massive difference other than to gaming, which we'll kind of talk about a bit later on. Now, like I've said to you, we have done testing on both boards. So in the graphs, you are going to see X470 and X570 tests. I'm going to leave the hard drive side of things more to the end though, because that's probably going to surprise a few people. But we have done dedicated tests on the Navi um, boards for X570 and X470 so that we can see the difference between PCI Express 3 and PCI Express 4. But you do need to be aware that we've used a 2080 Ti for the testing. Now that is to stress the throughput on the actual CPU rather than any kind of brand loyalty because at the end of the day, the 2080 Ti is a very, very quick, if not the quickest at the moment, kind of gaming aimed uh, graphics card. So we, we've, we've just gone with that just to be able to, like I said, stress the CPUs. Now, one thing I will say is because we switched to the 2080 Ti, every single one of the results in the graphs have been done within the last couple of weeks. It's not like the ones before where you can see the graphic, the CPUs that we've tested in the past, everything got retested. Everything got retested with up-to-date um, benchmarks. So it's all, at this present moment in time, just very, very comparable and massively fair as well. So there's no kind of quibbles in the graphs whatsoever. Now, we're gonna start with gaming. Now, the gaming, don't forget, this was all done on the 2080 Ti. Um, and you do get the 9900K and the 9700K topping the graphs in reality and you can see all of the um, most recent AMD ones just popping in underneath. There's nothing massive between them uh, but it's there and now I know a lot of people are now going to start saying about driver optimizations and game optimizations and all of that sort of stuff but I will say from a reviewer's perspective it gets shouted about too much when uh, AMD launches anything. And in reality, over a period of time, you might get a couple of games that do get changed, but they're not excuses that you can use with uh, Intel or Nvidia. And I don't particularly think that they're excuses that should be used for this either. They are just behind in the games. It's not a bad thing, because if you look further down the graphs, you can see how far they've come from where they were. And the other thing I'll say before people start pausing and writing out comments and starting to moan is this is the only, only slightly negative thing I have to say today. So if you're just, if you're gonna buy yourself a gaming rig and it's all about the oomph extra frames per second in a game, then yes, the 9900K is a very capable and easy processor to fit and forget. But you're also gonna get charged more money for it. Uh, and in reality, if you're, if you're 
competing if you're going to go and buy a 9900K, whereas you would have ended up buying a 3900X with, uh, a, let's say, um, X570, you're actually going to end up with a product that's slightly dated as well. So the, the X570 has at least got that kind of looking into the future and possibilities with <coughs> hopefully better graphics cards eventually and all of that sort of stuff. So sensible money would say, you know, why would you not go with something like the 3900X? But anyway, all the graph results are there. You can see them there with the Threadrippers at the bottom because obviously Threadripper is more of a um, uh, content creation kind of thing. But then we move on to what I would say is the more interesting stuff. Now, I'm going to start with Cinebench. Now, I'm going to pop a couple of graphs up for you because I've, I've filtered them in different ways. You can see the single threaded stuff first, and then I'll just change it. And it's exactly the same graph, but it's sorted then into the multi-threaded. And you can see that they've done incredibly well Again, now the single threaded, they don't quite top the graphs, but then when you mix in the multi-threaded, they're not gonna top the graphs, but look at the company they're keeping on that multi-threaded side of things. Now, this is when I get a bit argumentative. AMD fanboys, enthusiasts, just calm down a little bit, turn the heated seat off. You know, you don't need any flames underneath your bottom at the moment to start jumping off your seats. Just bear with me, just for a second, I think you might like this. Now, AMD say that the uh, 3900X is competition for the 9900K. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of uh, Cinebench runs. Now, this is the 3900X versus the 9900K. And it's really nice. It's a really nice graphical way that you can see it start to spin around and it's all really cool. And then obviously when we get to the end, you get the score at the end of it. Now that's, do you know what I mean? It's just the way it is. Everybody knows this benchmark, it's R20 by the way. And that's what AMD would say is its competition. Now it clearly, the 3900X1 wins. Now that would be because it's got four extra cores and it's got you know it's done really well it's got lots of extra threads but i would actually go as far as to say with amd i think that was a bit safe because in reality the 9900k is 480 quid i would actually say that it would be fairer for it to compete with the 3700x it's only 320 pound it's got the same cores it's got the same threads and if you put those together it's slightly closer matched you can watch the cores all kind of spinning round it's all nice it's like yeah la 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 and you're expecting me to have done that to have handed the win to intel but it doesn't and this is the point i'm trying to make is that the 3900x significantly cheaper uh, it's actually a low power part as well but when it gets to this it actually wins out and that's why if you go back into the graphs, and I'll bring the graphs up again, you can, if you go and find those results in that graph, the 3700X does incredibly well against the 9900K. Mix in overclocks and the things get a little bit more interesting as well. But it, nevertheless, I think that uh, AMD were a bit conservative with their comparisons in reality to competing products because the 30 uh, 700X absolutely decimates the um, uh, 9700K, which is what they were kind of saying that it competes with. Now, I'm, the, the next thing I'm going to do is bring back the prices into this again so that you can see prices in comparison because it's kind of critical at this point that we drive pricing home. And that is the fact that, as AMD said, that kind of competes with that, and that kind of competes with that. But now you've got some performance numbers out of me, you can kind of see how things are that little bit more interesting. Now, we have also started to do some... Uh, this is a custom Sony Vegas run that uh, we have put together ourselves, and it's what I would call a real-world benchmarking test. This is all done solely based on the CPU, 
It's our custom run, and again, all of these results have been done recently. It's been done on uh, Vegas 15. It's a multi-layered version of um, just, it's a snippet from a video review that we would have done in the past. And it's just a CPU render, and again, it's real world. But you, what you can see here, that things are rather interesting. Because if you were to go from, say, 3700X, you come in, you see the time, and then you go 9900X, come in, you see the time. And it's, I think, really interesting. And then if you were to go 3900X, sorry, I think we, we went 3700X, 9900K, now we'll go 3900X. Again, smash those um, times up, and then all of a sudden you filter into a graph, and you're like, oh, okay, things are rather interesting, aren't they? Because for, if you're going to be using this for gaming, yeah, okay, you are going to be a few frames per second behind. In the real world, those few frames per second aren't really going to make a great deal of difference. Um, if you're going to be like playing 4K and stuff, the, the gap narrows, massively, massively narrows. Because if you, um, we were testing at, uh, at 1080p, once you go up to 1440 and then 4K, the, the results, the, they narrow so small, it's very, you know, little between them. Those results there were probably the broadest results that you're going to see. And in reality, you're not really going to use that as kind of a benchmark for, you know, home use. Um, so Vegas, it did incredibly, incredibly well. And then we've also got our own custom version of Blender. So over 4 million polygons, we do a 1080 run and a 4K run as well. Now, at the top of the graph, because of the sheer amount of cords, Threadripper does kind of run home with the, uh, the win. And you do see some Intel near the top as well with the 9900, uh, 9980. But as you get further down the pack, you'll see you've got the um, 9980XE, you've got the 7980XE, and then you get to the 2950X, which is still a 16-core Threadripper part, quite expensive as well. And then just underneath it, you'll see that the uh, Ryzen 3000s then start to come in thick and fast. It's actually um, that they are trading places and having arguments with the 7900X from Intel. And the reason for that, yes, is the um, 3900X does have a couple of extra cores and it's up there with the clock speed as well. But it does go to show you that this is a 480 pound product, whereas the 7900 XE is almost twice the price. I, you can find them now for about 800 pounds, but in reality, twice the price, it's up there with the performance. Yeah, sure, you want, you know, an overclock drives the, the gap up that even bit more. But 7900X, 3900X, this absolutely, it just kind of romps home with it. Um, then we've got, uh, I've already said to you, um, like we did some uh, testing with stock um, um, uh, coolers as well. For the bulk of our testing, we were using a uh, H150 from Corsair. And we did that because when it comes to the overclocking side of things, we didn't want to reach any kind of like massive thermal limits or anything like that. Now with this, it does have a switch on the top for low and high. You, you are going to need it on high if you're going to run any overclocks. And all of the stock stuff were done on high. With low, essentially what low will do is it will make your experience that little bit quieter. But at the end of the day, overclocks would be a no-no. Now, uh, the 3900X can cope with a stock cooler at stock. The 3900X and the stock cooler, we would say a no-no for any kind of manual overclocking. Um, it gets a bit warm at the best of the times, to be fair, but it can cope with it. Again, you need it on high. With the 3700X, you can, you can overclock on it. It gets a bit warm, but it's capable. Now, you need to remember, we were doing this in a thermally controlled 20 degrees room as well. So, you know, overclocking at home when, you know, temperatures are going to get varied, summer in the UK at the moment for a couple of weeks at least anyway, things may get a bit shaky. 
I personally would say if you're going to overclock these, then you should invest in a uh, uh, an aftermarket cooler at least, whether it be an Air One or an AIO one. Um, and the more you invest, the quieter your um, experience is going to be long term. So if you get yourself a 240 millimeter AIO, you'll be able to drop the fan speeds down that little bit more. And it, it's just going to make running your system, even if it's doing a render or it's doing, you know, something really kind of in depth, then, you know, benchmarking, that sort of thing, then it's not going to make you deaf. Uh, and you'll still be able to run it when the weather's hot or your mum's turned the heating right up or something like that. Um, so you've got some answers with that. Now, we are going to be doing more on this. You'll see in the next few weeks, we've got a list as long as our arm of all the stuff we actually want to bring and show you. We just can't do everything for launch. Now, the other thing, you're probably wondering where the results are for Navi. So with Navi, tested it on both systems and it was literally just the difference between switching from X570 to X470. You'll get the point that I'm gonna make here in a minute when we start talking about this. So X470 to X570, it really didn't make any difference with these cards. The, the cards are not saturating the bandwidth for PCR Express 3. There's no real performance benefits for going to PCI Express 4 with either of these cards either. All of the results are within a run tolerance. But what this does mean with Navi is if you are at home and you're running a slightly older system and you are worried about you know, PCI Express 4 and all that sort of stuff, they are backwards compatible. So you can take them, chuck them in your older system. Now I do know that just before I made this video, AMD did announce to us that they were slashing the prices of the Navi cards. So with the Navi cards, I think they're going to be um, 399 and 329 GBP. And that worked out at around kind of $399 and uh, around that kind of dollar mark anyway. Um, so they did slash the prices. Now, they're still slightly more expensive than what the 2060 normal and 2070 normal will be. When you mix in about the, the because the NVIDIA fanboys are going to shout about the S, what you need to remember about the Supers is the 2060 S, boys and girls, is basically a 2070. They've just moved it down the product stack. The 2070 S is basically a 2080. They've just moved it down the product stack. The only thing that's really changed is they've now got Samsung memory on them because of all the Micron issues at the start. So when loads of people at the start of the NVIDIA stuff were shouting that it looked like the price, the performance had kind of been driven up the price scale, what NVIDIA have now done is they've dragged, because of AMD, they've dragged it back down the price scale. So all of you, those of you out there that went out and bought a 2060, thinking that, you know, with that sort of money, I could have got a 2070 last gen. Well, now you can. So that's essentially, they've just moved the price band back down again. It does make me wonder when the 2080 S comes out, which is basically going to be a 2080 Ti, what they then are going to put above because th there's no mention of a 2080 Ti Super. So, you know, what's coming? Have we got more performance coming later on? I don't know. But essentially, that's how NVIDIA have got the performance down. And that's also why AMD have now basically slashed £50 off of the Navi prices. Because with the Navi prices, they've just, they, they actually took 50 quid off of these and they've bumped it down. So that they make, um, I would say, kind of a, a reasonable um, uh, mid-range card option at those prices. I'd still say that they need another £25 taken off in reality. Uh, with the blower coolers, not necessarily that great. I will do a dedicated review on these. It is, there is a written review live on the website at the time, or will be when this gets fired. I just don't know whether I'll get a video live straight away. Um, but they, they, uh, that is the kind of thing that you need to think about, really. is there's a, there's a lot more going on. Now, I did promise you X570 to X470 comparisons. And we've seen with CPU performance that there isn't any real difference between them. The only thing so far that we've found is with memory, which I didn't mention before, the 3700X, uh, sorry, on uh, X470, they were capping out about 4.2, so 4,200 megahertz. I did forget to mention that before. But with X570, we got right the way up to um, 4.6. 
but this is where things get confusing is because we've now got PCR Express 4 solid state drives and we assumed that we would need PCR Express 4 motherboards to be able to run them but it would appear not it appears to be all about the CPU itself so if you were to buy one of these drives and use it on your 2700x you would get around you know kind of 3000 megahertz read writes but if you were to have let's say a crosshair 7 which is here which is x470 and you bought yourself either one of these chips so we'll say the 3700x you pop it in this board so x470 but with ryzen 3000 that drive will perform exactly the same as if you were to put it in an x570 board give or take so it's at this point things get quite confusing because what we've now kind of done is we found out that the x570 boards are considerably more expensive because of getting PCR Express 4 to run we know that the graphics cards aren't stressing out PCR Express 4 at all and you can get the same performance on either platform same with the 2080 Ti you can get the same performance on either platform so it's only really at this present moment in time so far from what I've spoken to you about memory that actually gets a performance increase which doesn't really give you any real world value and it's all about saying oh I've got X amount of memory running quickly so if it was me right now I would say that X570 is going to be about people investing in the future people that are literally looking for the, the the leading edge kind of thing this is going to be the sort of for the people that would have been buying x299 before this is for people that would have been buying a 7900x before and and we'll do this to make it more visual it's going to be people that would have been buying the 7900x before and really quick and expensive intel products whereas now you've genuinely got a platform that you can buy invest in with AMD that's going to give you the same performance if not better even when you talk about gaming because x299 was never a great gaming product um, uh, and then you can mix in your PCR Express 4 and you can have your quick memory and you can spend loads of money on it and it will be really quick but when we go back to x470 AMD is still going to be producing X470 and some of the other lower end platforms as well and you can take that same drive and pop it on this with that processor if you want it as well because this board is more than capable of running the 3900X if it wanted to you can have your quick PCR Express 4 speeds you can run 3600 megahertz memory 4000 megahertz memory 4200 megahertz memory if you really wanted to go for it and have an amazing system but maybe use that as an upgrade for the x470 board that you've got or go and buy an x470 board knowing that these prices are probably going to come down a bit now because of these ones and really the only thing that you need to go careful of with the x470 boards is with cores if you're going to buy the 3900x make sure you get a board with a decent vrm on it yes they're not massively like horrifically stressful but it's just something you're going to need to keep in mind you're going to want a slightly higher board if you're going to go up here but if you're going to buy the 39 sorry the 3700x then you know the old strixes and you know the bulk of the boards are absolutely going to be fine with this eight core you're going to be able to overclock it you're going to be able to do all the same things that we said about and still get those pcr express four speeds as well so Things have just got really interesting, but because they're all on X570 and X470 ness, <coughs> they've actually got quite complicated as well. So, if you have got an AMD rig at the moment and you're on X570 and you want to know, do you need to upgrade to X570 only if you want that PCR Express, sorry, if you want that USB 3.2 Gen 2 and do you know what I mean? And you know, you want to be on the nth or you know and up there with performance and I would say if you're going to go um, planning on going 3950x then I would say you're probably going to want to go x570 just because we know that the VRMs are going to be better and the boards are better tuned for you know performance and all of that sort of stuff 
The 3900X that we've got here kind of sits in between. If, you, if you're one of those people that just wants, you know, the most recent stuff and the best stuff, then yeah, you know, you are going to end up going X570. But you do have the option of kind of going um, on both platforms as well. But once you get to the 3700X and below, my opinion is that you stick with X470, especially if you've already got it or you can pick the board up cheaper. I don't see any reason for people to be buying these processors and then paying the prices for these motherboards. You just don't need PCI Express 4. And that's one of the things I think is quite sad about this launch is if AMD hadn't gone hell for leather with that PCIe 4 this time around and the boards had stayed that little bit cheaper, it actually would have been an absolute smash out the park home run. Sure, we could still have had really nice VRMs, but take all that extra complicatedness, you know, and the extra switches and the extra signal amplifiers off the boards and drive the prices down that little bit more. That then makes them a much easier product to sell. And I think what AMD have done by trying to push the boundaries of everything, it's actually made things kind of complicated. But that does mean for you at home, if you've got X470, don't worry, don't rush out to buy that board. These manufacturers, Asus, Gigabyte, MSI are gonna hate me for saying it, but maybe go and consider just getting a good X470 board instead. Or if you've already got one, just go and buy the processor. But the shocking thing about this, and it was something that even I wasn't prepared for, is that at least with this drive, and it's the Gigabyte Aorus one, uh, PCI Express 4, um, the performance that we were getting on this was 4,900 uh, reads and then 4,200 writes. This board costs the same, sorry, this board, this SSD costs the same as a two terabyte PCI Express 3 Samsung product at the moment. They're around 440 pound each, both two terabyte NVMEs, and yet one of them's 1500 and 1000 megahertz, 1500 reads and 1000 megahertz writes faster across the boards, even on old kit. And I think that's the big surprise with this. Now, I do know that there are gonna be newer drives coming out. There's another Fison controller coming out. Uh, probably middle of next year that's going to be offering somewhere around the kind of 6,000 megabytes a second and we might kind of reach the limit of uh, PCI Express 3 then or at least you know what we can get through the boards but to be honest with you at that point I, you know if you're spending that kind of money are you really going to care? I don't think that you will. So the long and short of it is the AMD CPUs are epic Single core performance is bob on, overclocking is good, we've got the core speeds up as well, it's made a really healthy difference. Obviously seven nanometer has done really well for keeping uh, temperatures down and also power levels down as well. But then when you mix in the kind of X570 side of things, it's a bit of a muddy kind of lake because with X570 it brings PCI Express 4 but we don't really have anything to kind of stress PCI Express 4 out yet. So you're kind of investing in stuff, a bit like RTX that's not really ready for anything yet. And you're, you are going to be investing in the future to try and future-proof your system. Uh, whereas if you just want the here and now and you just want bang for buck, you stay at X470, you go and buy any of the kind of processors, get yourself a decent hard drive, get yourself a decent cooler, overclock it to the, 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 you know, the hilt, drop whatever graphics card that you want in it, and you know that you're gonna have an absolute steaming system. That's also, the second that you do anything multi-threaded, going to smash Intel out of the picture entirely. And I love being able to say that. Um, and I'm thoroughly, thoroughly looking forward. Yes, I know I've got a whole load of X570 boards to test now, which I've kind of said that a lot of people aren't gonna need, but there are gonna be a lot of you out there that are just gonna invest in the future. And you're also, if you think about it, gonna be trying to invest in AMD as well, because if you don't start buying this stuff, then they're just not going to be um, doing much more of it, if you think about it. So if, you're, if you have been, annoyed, I was going to use the P word, but if you have been annoyed with the way Intel has been over the last couple of years, and I do think now they have been utterly caught with their pants down with these, and I love it. So if you are on the Intel and you've been debating, do I need to jump ship? I would say, hell yeah, get on it and 
do you know what I mean? Join the revolution for a change because AMD are well and truly back. They're not just, um, you know, producing products as an alternative now. This is viable competition. This is them right back up there with it. And I thoroughly look forward to doing the uh, 16 core later on because there's no way AM, uh, Intel are ever going to be able to get that running on Z390. Um, so they're always going to be going back to their X299, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I don't want to waffle on anymore because it's excitement and enthusiasm that's starting to come out now. And I'm also really struggling to remember what I've read, what I've spoken to you about, and what I've had to kind of like try and get my thoughts in place to get this video ready. So there, there has been a lot for us to talk about, and I, I'm glad, really, really glad that I spent so much time, or you know, we spent so much time, because it's a multi-headed approach to being able to put this much content live on OC3D. It's not just me. It's a team approach, and it, although there's only a few of us, we all have to pull some seriously late nights to get this stuff done. And I'm glad that we did th this right at the start because I think it's probably going to surprise a lot of people. It certainly surprised us, specifically with the performance that we got out of a PCI Express 4 drive when, yes, we had a PCI Express 4 CPU, but the board just wasn't. It was just an M.2. So, yeah, has been really interesting. We will have lots more to come. If you liked this video, then please subscribe and don't forget if you want to be kept up to date and this includes the regulars if you want to be kept up to date then hit the bell so because otherwise YouTube just won't tell you when I'm putting new videos live and I have a lot of boards to do I've got 12 motherboards here at this present moment in time you will see the Strix live for launch you will see the Gigabyte Master live for launch at this present moment in time I'm trying to make sure I get the MSI Carbon done for launch but it may just slip late into Sunday or early into Monday morning before I'm able to get it finished and then there's all kinds of other stuff I've got the Aorus Extreme I've got the Maxima sorry the Crosshair Formula I've got the uh, Prime X570 there's there's all sorts that I do have to try and get trundled through now but I hope you enjoyed this video hope you appreciate just how much time and effort has gone into trying to get all this data for us to be able to show you as well but for now at least, needed a drink of water because I've been talking so long on... Did I do one take? It was kind of one take. I think I stopped at one point because I swore. But anyway, this has been the tiniest of Logans with the 3700X and 3900X X470 versus X570 review out.